In this episode of Real Christianity, I answer the basic question, what is marriage? It's a simple question, but an important one. All that coming up right now. Welcome to Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge. This is an audio and video ministry of relearn.org. Today, we're going to be answering an important but simple question, what is marriage? But before we begin, I wanted to mention one thing. I updated the book, The Manliness of Christ. Uh, it's one of my uh, favorite books that I've ever written. And uh, it is originally, it was one of these small books right here. You can see the small, this is the first edition the subtitle of the book is How the Masculinity of Jesus Eradicates Effeminate Christianity. However, this book was small and I wanted to make it a little bit longer. So we added about 20 to 25% more. I added a, a completely new chapter called The Sin of Effeminacy. We also added a new foreword from my friend Eric Kahn, who is the uh, president over at New Christendom Press. I've also added several additions and paragraphs and edits throughout the entire book. So you can pick up a copy if you haven't already, or if you want to get an updated edition, it's still a pretty short book, but you can get one at relearn.org forward slash man. You can also pick up a copy on Amazon. All right, we're going to answer this question. What is marriage? Now, we live in this delightful era where a documentary can captivate millions of people called What is a Woman? And where global companies, politicians, presidents, even religious leaders, sports teams, they have seemed to misplace their understanding of basic truths regarding gender and sexuality and family and marriage. So I present to you in this episode a marvelous idea, a brief episode that aims to define the ever-elusive concept of marriage for this generation because clearly the world needs a little bit of a refresher on the topic. Okay, so what is marriage? Well, marriage is a sacred covenant between one man and one woman, established and ordained and defined by God, and therefore cannot be redefined by man. Now, marriage is not just an idea in Scripture. Uh, it's actually the overarching theme of Scripture. Uh, the first two chapters of the Bible are about God creating a new world for a man and his wife. And the last chapters of the Bible are about God renewing that fallen world uh, for a man and his wife. Now, the man and his wife in the second example is Christ and his bride. So marriage essentially is the enclosure of scripture. It's kind of a wraparound theme of the Bible. And so it's it's something that isn't just scattered throughout the Bible as a biblical theological theme. It's actually a pretty giant theme, start to finish, Genesis to Revelation. We see marriage, not just in Adam and Eve, but also in Christ and his church and everything in between. Ultimately, uh, it's an earthly picture of God's plan for redemption. That's what marriage is in the biblical understanding. Now, in a sense, marriage is a mirror of the gospel. It's a mortal reflection of an eternal promise. Uh, it's a visual metaphor of the everlasting covenant between Christ and his bride, the church, that's displayed here on earth for everyone to see. And this is why a distortion of marriage is such a big deal. Uh, and it sits at the heart of today's culture. If you can confuse marriage, you can also confuse the gospel or the promises thereof. And so Ephesians 5, 25 through 33 talks about the relationship between earthly marriage and its relationship with Christ and the church, the ultimate eternal marriage. And I'm going to read this text. It's a little bit long, and I'm going to kind of off the cuff bring a little bit of teaching, and then we're going to get back into some basic uh, points I have on this topic of what is marriage. So verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. 
In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. I mean, we know that we are the body of Christ. Uh, Christ loves us as his own body. Um, So there's some similarities that are happening there in verse 28. Uh, He who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29 says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Now I'm going to just stop right there for a second. This idea of no one ever hated his own flesh. I think about the passage that says, you know, um, you need to love others as you love yourself. Um, Everybody always twists that passage of scripture to support self-love. Well, if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. So you need to have practicing self-love so that you can love others. Okay, that's a bad exposition. No, what that passage means is that you love people the way that you already love yourself. Uh, We know that we love ourselves. I mean, passage of scripture right here says, for no one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And we know that because what happens when you get cold? What do you do? Well, you put a jacket on because you love yourself. And when you're tired, what do you do? Well, you go to sleep. When you're hungry, what do you do? You feed your body because you love yourself. And that passage of scripture is to say, hey, love people like you already love yourself. Don't twist it and say, oh, I need to first learn how to love myself before I can love others. That's just bad exposition. Okay, moving on back into the episode about marriage here. Uh, Verse 31, uh, actually the second half of verse uh, 29. It says, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. There's that connection, verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Paul is citing Genesis and the account of Adam and Eve and the ordination of marriage that happened early in the first three chapters of the Bible. Uh, Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Uh, There's debate on that word respects. There's another translation that some of the older translations would have is reverence her husband. I think the KJV talks about that or uses that word there. But it's a it's not just an Americanized version of respect, but it's really a, a reverential respect for the position of leadership that God has placed the husband in. And so um, great passage of scripture and some key takeaways. And this is where I'm, I'm really getting the doctrine for today's episode. And you can go back and study it on your own. Now, but just stop with me for a moment. And I just want you to think about something. Uh, Humans are forgetful. We need constant reminders. If you think through the Old Testament, God was always calling them to memorialize certain experiences that they had with God, to build an altar or, you know, to remember a, a certain particular action or moment in time. And so we would you know, this is what Passover was essentially, right? We are constantly looking for opportunities to uh, remember the things of God, the promises of God, the acts of God in our lives. And so uh, humans are forgetful and the power of symbolism is helpful to the weak minds of men. And again, we need memorialization in the Christian life uh, to help us remember what promises God has given to us. We need those visual symbols to retain those spiritual truths. This is why God gave us things like the Lord's Supper and uh, baptism, uh, you know, head coverings, marriage. These are physical actions that remind the church and teach the world something that's true about God and his plan for his people. They're not just arbitrary practices that have no intention or meaning. No, they're very important practices that teach or remind, teach the world or remind the church of vital truths regarding the gospel or regarding order within the church and the family or God's design for humanity or for righteousness sake, whatever it may be. And when you pervert, distort, or destroy the symbols, they lose their power to inform. And that's why it's so important that we maintain the integrity of what marriage is. It's also why I argue in my book, A Cover for Glory, 
uh, the argument of head coverings, you know, because head coverings are essentially the visual symbol representing the spiritual truth of the doctrine of headship, right? You have head symbols for a doctrine on headship. And when you lose the symbols, uh, you start to lose the doctrine of headship. And this is why the feministic era that we have been raised in and been saturated with has lost its understanding of the reason for head coverings. And we've become an egalitarian society at large. And especially we have been influenced in the church by that. And when you remove the symbols of station and authority, the visual symbols like a head covering, uh, you also begin to forget the qualifications for leadership. And so we're starting to see greater ordination of women because, hey, if we're essentially the same and there's no visual symbol there to remind us of our differences that are according to the word of God and our station and authorities and uh, roles and being how we're different, uh, then why can't women be pastors and why can't women preach? And, you know, we're essentially the same, right? And so, again, when we remove the symbols, we forget the truths that we are supposed to remember or be reminded by those practices. And so, uh, essentially, this is why we must fight at every level to protect the definition of marriage, gender, family, sexuality. They, they each are contributing pictures or prompts that uphold God's plan for fruitfulness and faithfulness and righteousness. Uh, secondly, marriage is not just the most intense form of human relationship. I think a lot of people think that marriage is just like another form of relationship on the relationship continuum, right? Like if you have like over here, you have, uh, you know, coworkers like are on the far right, like, hey, we're, we're friends, you know, we're acquaintances, you know, and, over, you know, then you have like, you know, maybe family relationships or best friends and, and then, you know, a mother of mother and son and, you know, whatever it may be. Then you have over here, you like the strongest human relationship is marriage. People think that it's like on the continuum, it's the strongest form of human relationship. Honestly, that's not true. Uh, I would say that uh, marriage isn't even a relationship at all. It, it intersects with relationship and romance and passion and all the things that come with marriage. But marriage, like as a noun, is a covenant. It's a covenant between two people built on love and faithfulness that catechizes the culture uh, toward Christ. And so it, it's, we got to think about, I mean, you don't become one in a relationship with anyone. So like, just think about that for a second. Uh, if, if it's if it is a relationship, there's no other relationships that you become one, uh, like marriage. You know, I become one with my wife. You don't become one with your best friend. You don't become one with your father or mother or your brother or sister. And again, so it, it has characteristics of relationship, but marriage in and of itself isn't even in the relationship category. It's something completely different. It is a covenant where two become one, and so. Just that's kind of an offshoot understanding of giving you some basics of what that means. Um, in uh, his book, The Momentary Marriage, Piper, John Piper writes, quote, the ultimate thing we can say about marriage is that it exists for God's glory. That is, it exists to display God. Marriage is not mainly about being or staying in love. It's mainly about telling the truth with our lives. It's about portraying something true about Jesus Christ and the way he relates to his people. It's about showing in real life the glory of the gospel, end quote. So yes, uh, marriage intersects with relationship and sex and companionship and family, but its central purpose is to show the world uh, how a man's love will prevent him from leaving his wife and how, a, or how Christ's love will prevent him from leaving his church. So it's this covenant relationship and it's demonstrating that for your children to show the, the commitment, the oneness that is occurring inside of marriage uh, for the procreation of children, for the furthering of the gospel, for the fruitfulness uh, that's commanded in the dominion mandate in Genesis chapter three. And so 
Uh, it's also showing how a woman will submit to her husband in all things as the church submits to Christ in all things. Marriage essentially is God's memoir to the world. And we should, as a result, protect it at all costs because we live in a time where it's absolutely being distorted at every possible level. And so that's my short episode on giving you a basic definition of marriage. Uh, one day I will write a book giving a full exposition on marriage. Uh, I've been married now for 13, going on 14 years, but I feel like it's one of those books that you want to wait. And you have more years under your belt before you write it. So anyways, thanks for listening to this episode of Real Christianity. If you haven't left a review, would you do so? Uh, you just have to tap the stars. Uh, you can leave a review and write a review. I'll read it if you do. I love checking out the reviews. We have over 6,000 reviews and those reviews are really helpful for getting exposure for the show. A lot of people find our show because we have so many reviews. So it's a great way to support what we're doing um, and uh, support the show by just leaving a review. On that note, again, this is Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge and I'll see you guys next time. 